Little House in the Big Woods. We are up to chapter 11, which is called Harvest. Pa and Uncle Henry traded work. When the grain got ripe in the fields, Uncle Henry came to work with Pa, and Aunt Polly and all the cousins came to spend the day. Then Pa went to help Uncle Henry cut his grain, and Ma took Laura and Mary and Carrie to spend the day with Aunt Polly. Pa, Ma and Aunt Polly worked in the house, and all the cousins played together in the yard until dinner time. Aunt Polly's yard was a fine place to play because the stumps were so thick. The cousins played jumping from stump to stump without ever touching the ground. Even Laura, who was the littlest, could do this easily in the places where the smallest trees had grown close together. Cousin Charlie was a big boy going on 11 years old and he could jump from stump to stump all over the yard. The smaller stumps he could jump two at a time and he could walk on the top rail of the fence without being afraid. Pa and Uncle Henry were out in the field cutting the oats with cradles. A cradle was a sharp steel blade fastened to a framework of wooden slats that caught and held the stalks of grain when the blade cut them. Pa and Uncle Henry carried the cradles by their long curved handles and swung the blades into the standing oaks. When they had cut enough to make a pile, they slid the cut stalks off the slats into neat heaps on the ground. So this is what the cradle, it's called a cradle. That's how they cut it. And then this is them bundling it after they cut it. It was hard work walking around and around in the field in the hot sun with both hands swinging the heavy cradles in the grain and cutting it and then sliding it into piles. After all the grain was cut, they must go over the field again. This time they would stoop over each pile and taking up a handful of the stalks in each hand, they would knot them together to make a long strand. Then gathering up the pile of grain in their arms, they would bind it tightly around with the band they had made and tie the band and tuck in its ends. After they made seven such bundles, then the bundles would be shocked. To make a shock, they stood up five bundles snugly together with the oats head up. Then over these, they put two more bundles, spreading out the stalks to make a little roof and a shelter the five bundles from dew and rain. Every stalk of cut grain must always be safely in the shock before dark, for lying on the dewy ground all night would spoil it. Pa and Uncle Henry were working very hard because the air was so heavy and hot and still, they expected rain. The oats were ripe, and if they were not cut, and into the shock before the rain came, the crop would be lost. And then Uncle Henry's horses would be hungry all winter. At noon, Pa and Uncle Henry came to the house in a great hurry and they swallowed their dinner as quickly as they could. Uncle Henry said that Charlie must help them that afternoon. Laura looked at Pa when Uncle Henry said that. At home, Pa had said to Ma that Uncle Henry and Aunt Polly spoiled Charlie. When Pa was 11 years old, he had done a good day's work every day in the fields driving a team, but Charlie hardly ever did any work. Now Uncle Henry said that Charlie must come to the field. He could save them a great deal of time. He could go to the spring for water and he could fetch them the water jug when they needed a drink. He could fetch the wet stone when the blades needed sharpening. All the children looked at Charlie. Charlie did not want to go help in the field. He wanted to stay in the yard and play, but of course he did not say so. Pa and Uncle Henry did not rest at all. They ate in a hurry and went right back to the field and right back to work, and Charlie went with them. Now, Mary was the oldest, and she wanted to play a quiet, ladylike type of game. So in the afternoon, the cousins made a playhouse in the yard. The stumps became chairs and tables and stoves, and little dishes were leaves, and sticks were the children. On the way home that night, Laura and Mary heard Pa tell Ma what happened in the field. Instead of helping Pa and Uncle Henry, Charlie was making all the trouble he could. He got in their way so they couldn't swing the cradles. He hid the whetstone so they had to hunt for it when the blades need sharpening. He didn't bring the water jug till Uncle Henry shouted at him three or four times, and then he was sullen. 
After that, he followed them around, talking and asking questions. They were working too hard to pay any attention to him, so they told him to go away and not bother them. But they dropped their cradles and ran to across the field when they heard him scream. The woods were all around the field and there were snakes in the oats. When they got to Charlie, there was nothing wrong at all. And he laughed and said, I fooled you that time. Pa said if it, he had been Uncle Henry, he would have tanned that boy's hide right then and there. But Uncle Henry did not do it. So they took a drink of water and went back to work. Three times Charlie screamed and they ran to him as fast as they could. And he laughed at them. He thought it was a good joke. And still, Uncle Henry did not tan his hide. Then a fourth time he screamed, louder than ever. Pa and Uncle Henry looked at him, and he was jumping up and down screaming. They saw nothing was wrong with him, and they'd been fooled by him so many times that they just went on with their work. Charlie kept screaming louder and shriller. Pa did not say anything, but Uncle Henry said, let him scream. So they went on working and let him scream. He kept jumping up and down and screaming and he did not stop. And at last, Uncle Henry said, maybe something really is wrong. They laid down their cradles and went across the field. All that time, Charlie had been jumping up and down on a yellow jacket's nest. The yellow jackets lived in a nest in the ground and Charlie had stepped on it by mistake. Then all the little bees in their bright yellow jackets came swarming out with their red hot stings and they hurt Charlie so that he couldn't get away. He was jumping up and down and hundreds of bees were stinging him all over. They were stinging his face and his hands and his neck and nose. They were crawling up his pant legs and stinging and crawling down the back of his neck and stinging. The more he jumped and screamed, the harder they stung. Oh my goodness. Isn't that terrible? Pa and Uncle Henry took him by the arms and ran him away from the yellow jacket's nest. They undressed him and his clothes were full of yellow jackets and their stings were swelling up all over him. They killed the bees that were stinging him and they shook the bees out of his clothes. They dressed him again and sent him to the house. Laura and Mary and the cousins were playing quietly in the yard when they heard a loud blubbering cry. Charlie came falling into the yard. His face was so swollen and his tears could hardly squeeze out of his eyes. His hands were puffed up and his neck was puffed out and his cheeks were big, hard puffs. His fingers stood out stiff and swollen. There were little, hard, white dents all over his puffed out face and neck. Laura and Mary and the cousins stood and looked at him. Pa and Aunt Polly came running out of the house to ask what was the matter. Charlie just blubbered and bawled. Ma said it was yellow jacket. She ran to the garden and got a big pan of earth while Aunt Polly took Charlie into the house and undressed him. They made a big pan full of mud and they plastered it all over him. They rolled him up in an old sheet and put him to bed. His eyes were swollen shut and his nose was a funny shape. Ma and Aunt Polly covered his whole face with mud and tied mud on with clo cloths. Only the end of his nose and, the mouth, and his mouth showed. Aunt Polly, Polly steeped some herbs to give him for his fever. Laura and Mary and the cousins stood around him for some time, looking at him. It was dark that night when Pa and Uncle Henry came back from the field. All the oats were in the shock, and now the rain could come and it would not do any harm. Pa said they could not stay for supper. He had to get home and do the milking. The cows were already waiting at home, and when cows are not milked on time, they do not give so much milk. He hitched up quickly, and they all got in the wagon. Pa was very tired, and his hands ached so that he could not drive very well, but the horses knew their way home. Ma sat beside him with baby Carrie, and Laura and Mary sat on the board behind them. Then they heard Pa tell what had Charlie had done. Laura and Mary were horrified. They were often naughty themselves, they never imagined that anyone could be as naughty as Charlie had been. He hadn't worked to help save the oats. He hadn't minded his father quickly when his father spoke to him. He had bothered Pa and Uncle Henry when they were hard at work. Then Pa told about the yellow jacket's nest and Pa said it served him right. After, oh, sorry. It served that little liar 
right, is what Pa said. After she was in the trundle bed that night, Laura lay and listened to the rain drumming on the roof and streaming from the eaves, and she thought about what Pa had said. She thought about what the Yellow Jackets had done to Charlie. She thought it served Charlie right, too. It served him right, because he had been so monstrously naughty, and the bees had the right to sting him when he jumped on their home. But what she didn't understand was why Pa had called him a little liar. She didn't understand how Charlie could be a liar when he had not said a word. Okay. This one is called The Wonderful Machine. Oh my goodness, we only have two chapters left. Okay. So I think what Pa is talking about is the fact that he kept pretending that something was wrong. And that was lying. It's like a boy cried wolf. But that's the wonderful machine. As you can tell, they had no machines. They were doing all this by hand, which was incredible hard work. Next day, Pa cut the heads from several bundles of the oats and brought the clean, bright yellow straws to Ma. She put them in a tub of water to soften them up and keep them soft. Then she sat in the chair by the side of the tub and braided the straws. She took several of them, knotted their ends together, and began to braid. The straws were different lengths, and when she came to the near end of one straw, she put a long new one from its tub in its place and went on braiding. She let the end of the braid fall back into the water and kept on braiding till she had many yards of braid. All her spare time for days, she was braiding straw. She made a fine, narrow, smooth braid using seven of the small straws. She used nine larger straws for a wider braid and she made it notched all along the edges. And from the very largest straws, she made the widest braid of all. When all the straws were braided, she threaded a needle with strong white thread. And beginning at the end of the braid, she sewed it around and around, holding the braid so it would lie flat after it was sewed. This made a little mat, and Ma said it was the top of the crown of a hat. Then she held the braid tighter on one edge and kept sewing around and around. The braid drew in and made the sides of the crown. When the crown was high enough, Ma held the braid loosely again, and she kept on sewing around, and the braid lay flat. When the brim of the hat was wide enough, Ma cut the braid and sewed the ends fast so it could not unbraid itself. Ma sewed hats for Mary and Laura from the finest, narrowest braid. For Pa and for herself, she made hats out of the wider, notched braid. That was Pa's Sunday hat. Then she made him two everyday hats with the coarser, widest braid. When she finished a hat, Ma set it on a board to dry, shaping it as nicely as she did. So when it dried, it stayed in the shape she gave it. Ma could make beautiful hats. Laura liked to watch her, and she learned how to braid the straw, and she made a little hat for Charlotte. And here's what the hats look like. So they're made out of straw, straw hats, and they're braided, and then they're shaped. The days were growing shorter and the nights were cooler. One night, Jack Frost passed by, and in the morning there were bright colors here and there among the green leaves of the big woods. Then all the leaves stopped being green. They were yellow and scarlet and crimson and golden and brown. Along the rail fence, the sumac held up its dark red cones of berries above bright flame-colored leaves. Acorns were falling from the oaks, and Laura and Mary made little acorn cups and saucers for their playhouses. Walnuts and hickory nuts were dropping to the ground in the big woods, and squirrels were scampering busily everywhere, gathering their winter store of nuts and hiding them away in their hollow trees. Laura and Mary went with Ma to gather walnuts and hickory nuts and hazelnuts. They spread them in the sun to dry. Then they beat off the dried outer hulls and stored the nuts in the attic for winter. It was fun to gather the round walnuts and the small hickory nuts and the little hazelnuts that often grew in bunches on the bushes. The soft outer hulls of the walnuts were full of a brown juice that stained their hands, but the hazelnut hull smelled good and tasted good. And when Laura used her teeth to pry a nut loose, she could taste it. Everyone was busy, for all the garden vegetables must be stored away. Laura and Mary helped picking up the dusty potatoes after Pa had dug them from the ground and pulling the long yellow carrots and the round purple top turnips, and they helped Ma cook the pumpkin for pumpkin pies. With the butcher knife, Ma cut the big orange-colored pumpkins into halves. 
she cleaned the seeds out of the center and cut the pumpkin into long slices from which she pared the rind. Laura helped her cut slices into cubes. Ma then put the cubes into a big iron pot on the stove, poured in some water, and then watched while the pumpkin slowly boiled down all day long. All the water and the juice must be boiled away, and the pumpkin must never burn. The pumpkin was a thick, dark, good-smelling mass in the kettle. It did not boil like water, but it bubbled. But bubbles came up in it and suddenly exploded, leaving holes that closed quickly. Every time a bubble exploded, the rich, hot pumpkin smell came out of it. Laura stood on a chair and watched the pumpkin for Ma and stirred it with a wooden paddle. She held the paddle in both hands and stirred carefully because if the pumpkin burned, there wouldn't be any pumpkin pies. For dinner, they ate the stewed pumpkin with their bread. They made it into pretty shapes on their plates. It was a beautiful color and smooth and molded so prettily with their knives. Ma never allowed them to play with their food at the table. They must eat nicely everything that was set before them, leaving nothing on their plates. But she did let them make the rich brown stewed pumpkin into pretty shapes before they ate it. At other times, they had baked Hubbard squash for dinner. The rind was so hard that Ma had to take Pa's ax to cut the squash into pieces. When the pieces were baked in the oven, Laura loved to spread the soft insides with butter and then scoop the yellow flesh from the rind and eat it. For supper now, they often had whole corn and milk. That was good too. It was so good that Laura could hardly wait for the corn to be ready, and Ma started to hull it. It took two or three days to hull the corn. The first day, Ma cleaned and brushed all the ashes out of the cook stove. Then she burned some clean, bright hardwood and saved its ashes. Then she put the hardwood ashes into a little cloth bag. That night, Pa brought some ears of corn in with large, plump kernels. He nubbed the ears, shelling off the small chafy kernels at the tips. Then he shelled the rest of it into a large pan until the pan was full. Early the next day, Ma put the shelled corn and a bag of ashes into the big iron kettle. She filled the kettle with water and kept it boiling a long time. At last, the kernels of corn began to swell, and they swelled and swelled until their skins split open and began to peel off. When every skin was loose and peeling, Ma lugged the heavy kettle outdoors. She filled a clean wash tub with cold water from the spring and she dipped the corn out of the kettle into the tub. Oh, there's Ma doing the work. Then she rolled the sleeves of her flowered calico dress up above her elbows and she knelt by the tub. With her hands, she rubbed and scrubbed the corn until the hulls came off and floated on top of the water. When she poured the water off and filled the tub again with buckets of water from the spring, she kept rubbing and scrubbing the corn between her hands and changing the water until every hull came off and was washed away. Ma looked pretty with her bare arms, plump and white, her cheeks so red and her dark hair smooth and shiny. While she scrubbed and rubbed the corn in the clear water, she never splashed one drop of water on her pretty dress. When at last the corn was done, Ma put all the soft white kernels in a big jar in the pantry. Then at last, they had hulled corn and milk for supper. Sometimes they had hulled corn for breakfast with maple syrup, and sometimes Ma fried the soft kernels in pork drippings. But Laura liked them best with milk. So I think hulled corn is just like corn off of the cob, little niblets of corn. Autumn was great fun. There was so much work to do, so many good things to eat, so many new things to see. Laura was scampering and shattering like the squirrels from morning to night. One frosty morning, a machine came up the road. Four horses were pulling it and two men were on it. The horses hauled it up into the field where Pa and Uncle Henry and Grandpa and Mr. Peterson had stacked their wheat. Two men drove after another in with a smaller machine. Pa called to Ma that the threshers had come, and then he hurried out to the field with his team. Laura and Mary asked Ma, and then they ran out to the field with him. See, excuse me, after him. They might watch if they were careful and did not get in the way. Uncle Henry came riding up and tied his horse to a tree. Then he and Pa hitched all the other horses, eight of them, to the smaller machine. They hitched each team to the end of a long stick that came out from the center of the machine. A long iron rod lay along the ground from this machine to the big machine. 
Okay, so I'm going to show you a picture of this. this is, I'll show you, this is the smaller machine. So that's them going in a circle. And then there is like, it's attached, even though here it doesn't look like it, it's just because of the book. But it's attached to this other machine. And that looks like that. That's what they're talking about. Okay. Afterward, Laura and Mary asked questions, and Pa told them that the big machine was called the separator, and the rod was called the tumbling rod, and the little machine was called horsepower. Eight horses were hitched up to it and made it go. So this was an eight horsepower machine. A man sat on top of the horsepower, and when everything was ready, he clucked to the horses and they began to go. They walked around him in a circle, each team pulling on the long stick to which it was hitched and following the team ahead. And as they went around, they stepped carefully over the trembling rod, which was tumbling over and, oh, the tumbling rod, sorry, the tumbling rod, which was tumbling over and over on the ground. Their pulling made the tumbling rod keep rolling over and over, and the rod moved the machinery of the separator, which stood beside the stack of wheat. All this machinery made an enormous racket, banging and clanging. Laura and Mary held tight to each other's hands at the edge of the field and watched with their eyes wide. They had never seen a machine before. They had never heard such a racket. Pa and Uncle Henry on top of the wheat stack were pulling bundles down to a board. A man stood at the board and cut the bands of bundles and crowded the bundles one at a time into a hole at the end of the separator. The hole looked like the separator's mouth and it had long iron teeth. The teeth were chewing. They chewed up the bundles and the separator swallowed them and straw blew out of the separator's end and wheat poured out the other side. Two men were working fast, trampling the straw and building it into a stack. One man was working fast, sacking with pouring grain, putting the pouring grain in sacks. The grains of wheat poured out of the separator into half bushel measure. And as fast as the measure filled, the man slipped an empty bag in the spot and filled and emptied the full one into a sack. He had just enough time to empty it and slip it back under the spout before another measure ran over. All the men were working as fast as they possibly could, but the machine kept right up with them. Laura and Mary were so excited they could hardly breathe. They held their hands tightly and stared. The horses walked around and around. The man who was driving them cracked his whip and shouted, Giddy up, John. No use trying to shirk. Crack went the whip. Careful there, Billy. Easy boy. You can't go. You can't go, but so fast, no how. Giddy up there. The separator kept swallowing the bundles. The gold and straw blew out like a golden cloud. The wheat streamed golden brown out of the spout while the men hurried. Pa and Uncle Henry pitched bundles down as fast as they could. The chafe and the dust blew all over everything. Laura and Mary watched as long as they could. Then they ran back to the house to help Ma get dinner ready for all those men. A big kettle of cabbage and meat was boiling on the stove. A big pan of beans and a Johnny cake was baking in the oven. Laura and Mary set the table for the threshers. They put on salt rising bread and butter, bowls of stewed pumpkin, pumpkin pie, dried berry pie, cookies, cheese, and honey, and pitchers of milk. Then Ma put out boiled potatoes and cabbage and meat, baked beans, the hot Johnny cake, and the baked squash that and she poured the tea. Laura always wondered why bread made of cornmeal was called Johnny cake. It wasn't cake. Ma didn't know unless the Northern soldiers called it Johnny cake because the people in the South where they fought ate so much of it. They called the Southern soldiers Johnny rebels. Maybe they called the Southern bread cake. Maybe they called their Southern bread cake just for fun. Ma had heard some say it should be called journey cake. She didn't know why. It wouldn't be very good bread to take on a journey. At noon, the threshers came into the table loaded with food. There was not too much, though, for the threshers worked hard and got very hungry. By the middle of the afternoon, the machines had finished all the threshing, and the men who owned them drove them away into the big woods, taking with them the sacks of wheat that were their pay. They were going to the next place, where neighbors had stacked their wheat and wanted the machine to thresh theirs. Pa was very tired that night, but he was happy. He said to Ma, it would have taken Henry and Peterson and Pa and me a couple of weeks of peace 
to thresh that much grain with flails as that machine threshed today. And we couldn't have gotten as much wheat either, and it wouldn't have been as clean. That machine is a great invention, he said. Other folks can stick to old-fashioned ways if they want to, but me, I'm all for progress. It's a great age we're living in. As long as I raise wheat, I'm going to have a machine come and thresh it, if there's one anywhere in my neighborhood, said Pa. He was too tired to talk that night to Laura, but Laura was proud of him. It was Pa who had got the other men to stack their wheat together, and it was Pa who sent for the threshing machine. And it was a wonderful machine, and everybody was glad it had come. So that was chapter 12. We have one more chapter, so I'll save that one for tomorrow.